I want to welcome all the United States Sarans, the friends of Sarah, and the Sarans from around the world um, to this, our 46th Sarah Meets, our 46th meeting. Uh, our first meeting aired in December 12th in 2020, and this is our 46th. I'm your host, Ann Rote. And I'm a member, I'm president of the U.S. Council of Sarah International, and I'm a member of the Lafayette, Indiana Sarah Club. And so I officially call this meeting to order, and I'm going to invite Anne Champagne, who is the regional director of the Pacific region, and she's a member of our U.S. Council, to lead us in our opening prayer. Anne? Thank you, Anne. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O God, who wills not the death of a sinner, but rather that he be converted and live, grant, we beseech you, through the intercession of the Blessed Mary Ever-Virgin, St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Junipero Serra, and all the saints, an increase of labors for your church, fellow laborers with Christ, to spend and consume themselves for souls through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anne. Um, as many of you know, this meeting is being recorded, and then later on, it can be accessed through the Sarah YouTube channel. And a link to this meeting will be published on the uh, sarahus.org website. I know many of our clubs view this meeting live, but some of them also uh, use it as a part of their um, monthly meetings, and they use that recording just uh, in place of a speaker oftentimes. The meeting's just about an hour, and it takes the form of a typical Sarah Club meeting. So we have our opening prayer, we have a speaker, we have some business, and then a closing prayer. Uh, we do expect to have time for questions and answers. So you're going to see at the bottom of your screen something that has Q and A, and that's where you're going to put your questions. Uh, following the keynote presentation, we'll take, we'll take some time for questions. Um, our keynote speaker today, we're in for a treat. This is Father mm -hmm. Jonathan St. Andrew, Andre, who is a Franciscan friar of the Third Order Regular, and he's a priest. Father Jonathan currently serves as the Vice President of Franciscan um, uh, Life at Franciscan University in Steubenville. He's a 1996 graduate of, um, of the Franciscan University. And while he was there, I love this combination. He studied mental health, theology, and philosophy. Uh, Father Jonathan professed his vows in 2000 and received his MDiv in uh, 2005, um, uh, right in preparation for the priesthood. He was ordained in 2006. He also has a master, an MA in Franciscan studies from St. Bonaventure University, where Thomas Merton went to school, and mm -hmm. is currently pursuing an education doctorate. He's going for his doctorate in leadership and organization from the University of Dayton, which is also in Ohio. Father Jonathan has been blessed to serve in various ministries without, within his community, including vocation formation, university campus ministry, and formation uh, for men in the novitiate. His interests include cycling and reading, and he grew up in Northern Virginia, and he's in Ohio right now, and he's the oldest of four children. And his talk, which I, I was just uh, thrilled to hear the title, and it, his talk, the title is let the fire fall. Lessons learned about the call for religious vocations. Father Jonathan St. Andre, welcome to Sarah Meets. Thank you very much, Anne. It's great to be with you, and thanks for all of you inviting me to join you tonight. I'm very excited. Um, I, I was able to talk with Jerry and Greg uh, in preparation, so thank you to Jerry for um, just the, the, the welcome to join you. Uh, I, I was thinking tonight that, um, uh, of course, being a Franciscan, uh, uh, I have a, a bias towards uh, St. Junipero Serra, uh, and I also had um, the opportunity to be at his canonization uh, in Washington, D.C. in 2015 when Pope Francis canonized him. So it was a oh, beautiful moment in the church. <laughs> uh, so I'm just thrilled to be with you tonight and to share with you 
and look forward to not only sharing with you um, in my presentation, but having some good conversation with you through the, the questions and answers. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. So um, I wanted to, to do two things in my, in my talk tonight. One is to reflect a little bit on a scripture. Uh, it, it should be a scripture that is very familiar to you. And in fact, it's come up in the readings lately. Um, and I think it, it has some beautiful gems in it. The word of God always speaks the best. And it has some beautiful gems for us in terms of considering a call to a vocation in the church and considering all of us in the call that we have to spread the gospel. And, and so this passage is from the gospel of Luke chapter 10. And I'm going to, it says Luke 10 um, verses 1 to 12. Luke 10, 1 to 12. And I'm going to read this. I'm going to make a few comments and applications to this passage. And then I'm going to share, as the title indicates, a few lessons that I hope that I've learned and continue to learn along the way in trying to be open to the Holy Spirit and prom promoting the, the call to uh, church vocations. So this is from Luke chapter 10. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is abundant, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near. So we hear in this beautiful passage from Luke, this call where Jesus is sending out the 72. And we know that this is a call for us as well, that this is an invitation for every baptized believer in the Lord to go out and to share what we've received. We also know that in order to do this, we need to live our call and for I think most of you on this, this call, it is a call to be vibrant and holy lay people in the church. And we need also to promote and encourage many, I believe, who are called to live as men and women in the consecrated life, men in priesthood, and just serving the church in different ways. First of all, we should never take for granted the gift that the Lord calls us to be laborers, that the Lord has called us to labor for the gospel, that the Lord has called us to cooperate with his work. We are appointed and we are sent. And I think it's interesting in Luke 10 too, he says, he sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. The Lord has a mission and he sends his, he sends those he points ahead of him. He sends us to the places that he is going to come. He wants to use us. He wants to, he wants to work in us. And I think that in a very beautiful way, as I think each of you recognize, and that's why you're a part of Sarah International, is you recognize the beautiful work and the beautiful call of men and women who are called to a vocation in service of the church. And that if we're going to promote those calls, we need to go 
and we need to meet these young men and young women, or sometimes not as young men and young women, responding to the call when the Lord has called them. We need to meet them where they're at, develop relationships with them, go into the place where they are. And, you know, I think of a few friars in my community, one who I came into contact with and, and who somehow God allowed me to use to encourage them. And for one of them, it was just me working as a younger friar here at Franciscan University and seeing that I had something in common with this young man, his name was Jonathan also, and seeing that we had both done net ministries. Uh, and in Minnesota, you might've heard of net. Net is a Catholic ministry of evangelization. And I began to meet with this young man on our campus and just through that commonality, we would talk and later he would say that was sort of the seed of me becoming interested in the Franciscans, is that you took time with me, you spent time with me. In a sense, you could say, I went into the place where he was, and the Lord kind of prepared the ground there. And then another young man who's now been a priest several years in our community, Father Zach, I was a chaplain for our cross-country team at our sister school, St. Francis University, and he was a Division I track and field and cross country athlete. And honestly, we never had huge conversations, but I got to know him through that team. And he said at a later point, glory to God, that I started to become a mirror for him to see that maybe this could be a way of life where he could find fulfillment in the Lord. And I didn't even have explicit conversations with him. I was just faithful to being in the place where he was and serving. And I think that, that we're called to that. And I hope that each of you have some connections, whether it be just in your own families or in your area where you are in the relationships that God has given you, that you are, in a sense, inviting, loving, showing people maybe something they don't see in themselves that they might consider. It's interesting, as the passage in Luke goes on, it says, and he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Isn't that our call to pray for laborers? To pray. So don't ever think that your prayers do not matter. I can see in my own community and other communities that your prayers are efficacious, that men and women are responding to the call. They are responding and seeking the Lord, and the Lord is using them and working through them. And so be encouraged in that, but also recognize that there is a scarcity of laborers. That's what this passage says, that the laborers are few. And maybe the Lord's inviting us to recognize our poverty, that we can't change the circumstances, but we can pray to the one who gives every call. We can place our prayers, our fervent prayer, that the Lord's will will be accomplished and his will, his will will be accomplished. And we can be collaborators in that. He is the Lord of the harvest. None of us are the Lord of the harvest. We are fortunate and blessed if we can cooperate with him, if we can in some way be used by him, but everything is through him and in him, through him, with him, and in him as we pray in the doxology of the mass, when the gifts are lifted up, when the body and blood and soul and divinity of Jesus Christ are lifted up, everything is through the work of the Son to the glory of the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving, is working. He also says in that passage that I send you like lambs in the midst of wolves. We might even feel like that sometimes. We might feel like the culture is a wolf. And we are the lambs, and we're not affecting much. But don't forget the greatest lamb, the lamb of God. The lamb of God is the one who is victorious over the sins of the world. And the lamb of God is the one who is prime, it has the primacy over this culture and is Lord. And the lamb of God is moving hearts. He's moving men and women to want to follow and to seek him in a service to the church. The next part of Luke 10, and I love this as a Franciscan, he says, carry no money bag, 
No knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. I wish I could say I travel like that. I always joke. I, I usually feel like I have more, much more than I need. And don't most of us do that? Don't we try to think I need to rely on my own needs? I need to, I need to carry that extra with me. But ultimately, it, we need to take nothing for the journey. We need to rely on the Lord. We need to just keep moving forward, as St. Unipero Sarah did. Just keep moving forward to share the good news, the message of the gospel, and to believe that it will, it will take fruition. Now, when you continue on in that passage, it's interesting. He says to the 72 that he sends out, Whatever house you enter, say, Peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide. For the laborer deserves his wages. So Jesus says to them, go into a town, the two of you, and go enter a house and basically wish them peace and see if they will invite you into a deeper relationship. And I think that that's a good model for us, like in the people in our life. For me, it's college students. For me, it, you might be your grandchildren or your children. It might be other members of your parish. It might be people at your workplace. Whoever you're coming in contact with, you bring the peace of Christ. But that peace also is a mission-oriented peace. We have to be willing, and, I, and I'm the first one to say I need to do this better, to share the gospel and to share the invitation that each and every person has a call that's indispensable, a call that's needed for the life of the church, and to not be afraid to share that. And one of the things that I talked with Greg and Jerry about in relation to this talk was, you know, what are, what are some of the things that perhaps the young people today are facing that are different than previous generations that might influence their vocational discernment? And I think that this is one of them. There are so many choices at their fingertips, literally fingertips, phones. There are so many choices. And, and that's not a bad thing, but the choices we have at our fingertips can mitigate against just taking a step towards an option. And I was thinking, I was, uh, what I mean, I wanna connect this even to the gospel that I just read. Jesus says, do not go from house to house. He encourages them to sort of stay in one place, to stay with one thing. But young people today are being tempted by the culture, we all are, to flip from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another. And we're never really grounded, rooted in the Lord. And that can be something that attacks an openness to the Holy Spirit. We're flitting from one thing to the next. We're not rooted. We're not grounded. And we don't even take time to still ourselves to try to listen to the voice of our Lord that can lead us and guide us in our life. So I think we need to try to encourage the young people we work with and the not-so-young people. Sometimes we need to even sort of just turn off some of the elements in our life and focus on what is real, what is in front of us, what's before us. Then Jesus says to them, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick in it and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. It's interesting. He encourages them to first seek to heal and then to preach the gospel, the, the truth of the kingdom. And I think today, just because of the environment that they have grown up in, many um, young men and women are in need of healing. Need of healing in body, mind, and spirit. And the ravages of a culture, unfortunately, imbued with pornography, imbued with a lot of um, just senseless violence has impacted them and they need healing at a cultural level and a number of them just need healing of their person and some of them have just not even grown up <laughs> and they need people to accompany them as they grow up as they grow in grace and wisdom as it was said of Jesus in the family of Mary and Joseph 
And if I could encourage you with the people in your life, your children, your grandchildren, your coworkers, any young people you meet, just walk with them if you can, be with them, you know, ask them about what God is doing in their life. Don't simply jump to the question of, do you think you might be a priest or a sister? <laughs> Not a bad question, but ask them more, well, what is God doing in your life? What are you passionate about in your life? What are you hopeful for? If you have that level of relationship, and if you don't have that level of relationship, maybe you're being invited to get to know them better and talk to them in that way. Okay, that's the first part of my talk. The second part is, some lessons that I've learned along the way, and I hope they're inspired by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And I'll share a little bit of my own journey in this too. Um, so the first lesson that I have learned is to be seen and known and invited is powerful. To be seen and known and invited is powerful. All of us need to be seen and known and invited. And that is so important. It can't be taken for granted. And I, I walk around our campus here, and we have a pretty friendly campus at Franciscan University of Steubenville, but I see young people, too, who I can tell, they're just wondering, does anybody kind of notice who I am? Am I valued here? Am I seen? Am I known? Am I invited? And I think that if we can do that, if we can be instruments of that with people in our life, to let them know that they are seen and known and invited, that's so powerful, you know? And, you know, I'll tell you just a quick story. Like for me, like when I was doing net ministries, as I told you, it was after I had graduated at Franciscan and we, my teammates said to me, hey, Jonathan, have you ever thought about being a priest? And my first reaction to be real honest was, what do you think I can't get a girlfriend or something? And that was the first thing I said to them. Maybe I was a little bit defensive. And they said to me, no, it's just that we see that you love meeting the priests and sisters when we stop at a parish to do a retreat. You love leading prayer. You love to sing. And we could see you doing this. And all of a sudden, because they saw Christ working in me and they saw that, I began to see the possibility in myself for that. And I began to be open to that in my life. The second lesson I've learned is young people um, need support to grow in their roots as a person. And what do I mean by that? Young people need support to grow in their roots as a person. I often see a vocation, whether it be to be a religious brother, a religious priest, a diocesan priest, a woman in consecrated life, a consecrated virgin, a deacon, a married person, all of those states of life in the church, they need to be grounded in good soil with good roots. Does that make sense? If you don't have good roots in the Lord, if you're not healthy and holy, not perfect, but healthy and holy, then it's going to be hard to be faithful to that state in life to which you are called. And so anything that can help you and I and the people we invite to consider a call to just be more healthy as a human being, and Anne noted that I was a mental health major, so that's probably where this comes out. There's a heck of a lot of, if you talk to religious formators and vocation directors, while spiritual formation, and you know probably the pillars of formation um, from the program of priestly formation, spiritual formation is extremely important. But one thing we're seeing a greater need for is human formation, that young people are needing more just basic human formation, you know, in, in healthy human ways of living and healing where they've been hurt or experienced trauma in their life. Um, and that's just really important. So if we can help people with that, and you can help with people with that, your relationship can be healing. And I can tell you, like, people, as I look at least at the panelists, and I don't think you'll be insulted by this, 
but you look more in the grandparent stage, some of you, and that is a beautiful thing. And you have an important role. One of the greatest gifts I had coming to religious life is all of my grandparents, except one, died when I was very young. And what happened when I became a Franciscan friar, as a young friar, I gained a bunch of grandfathers. I had spiritual fathers and spiritual grandfathers. And I also had spiritual grandmothers because I got to meet some wonderful religious sisters who had lived the life for many years. And they helped shape me and form me in my vocation. So we want to develop relationships where we support the growth of roots so that people can be healthy and living out their state life. A third lesson that I've learned along the way, and it's a very simple phrase. It's not my own, but I'm not sure who shared it with me. Action produces clarity. Action produces clarity. You can't discern a call, whatever it may be, in your head. Yes, you can think about it, but at some point you have to act. You have to have the courage to ask the young lady out on a date. You have to have the courage to go on a come and see weekend. You have to have the courage to fill out the application. You have to have the courage to become a postulant in a religious community, to enter the novitiate, to go to seminary for a particular diocese. And there are a lot of young people today who think, I have to have it figured out in my head and then I'll do it. And I tell them, no, take a step. Don't worry. They, have you heard of FOMO? They talk about fear of missing out. F-O-M-O, -O, fear of missing out. That's a big thing in the generation. And I tell them, don't get into FOMO. Be afraid of not committing to anything. <laughs> that is a danger in life. Make a small commitment and see where it goes. And small commitments will lead you to greater commitments. Don't be afraid. Action produces clarity. I'm sure it's the case in your lives. You took an action and you knew a little bit more. It opened other doors and it closed other doors. A fourth lesson learned. Pray for a deeper outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pray for a deeper outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We want to pray for that for our world, for the church, for our nation. And we want to pray that the Holy Spirit would ignite hearts to be on fire. Because if the Holy Spirit occupies a heart, that heart can respond to the call of the Lord more fully. And the Lord needed that Holy Spirit to come upon his disciples so they could go out and answer their own call, their invitation to follow the Lord. One of the beautiful things of being at the Franciscan University of Steubenville is I think that's what happened on our campus, is that in a particular way, for no merit of his own, one of our friars, Father Michael Scanlon, almost 50 years ago, was asked to, to become president of a failing college in Midwestern Ohio. And he told them, I'll do it as long as you let me do it the way I feel the Lord's calling me to call do it. And they were so desperate, they said that they would. And what his vision was, was not to dive further into the relativism of the late 60s and early 70s, not to relax the standards of when students would go to mass and not to give in to co-ed dorms, but to actually go the opposite way and to say, no, God's calling you to greater things. God's calling you to a deeper life in the Holy Spirit a deeper life where you can live, a moral life where you will find fulfillment. And he began to really share a new vision. And he himself had prayed for the an opening to the Holy Spirit, a gift of what he called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's only one baptism, a sacramental baptism. But what Father Michael Scanlon meant was to pray for a stirring up of the gifts and the graces we receive at our baptism. And that's an invitation to all of us, whether you're 16 or 96, you're called to have more of the Holy Spirit, more of the Spirit of God in your life. And then it overflows to others. 
it touches others and it moves among others. And because of that, young people started to come to Franciscan and they started conferences for priests and young adults. And, and now today, our university is an instrument across the world to the glory of God. And that was simply just being open to the gift and the graces of the Holy Spirit in our life. And finally, a final lesson, a vocation is fragile. Please pray for protection for those who have already responded. I see in the men in initial formation in our community, they go through their life and they go through seminary and it's beautiful, but it can be easy for them to lose their way. They might get a little lost in studies. They might get discouraged at times. So don't just pray for people to respond, but pray for people to persevere. Pray for me to persevere, please. You know, that we might persevere in joy. God forbid that I am a cranky or unexcited or listless friar and priest. I want to continue to be open to the Holy Spirit, and I need the prayers and support of others. And you need it when you're in early on in your initial formation. You need it when you're later on. You need it to persevere. We all need that. So please pray for that. So this has been a little bit of here, there, and everywhere, but that's my basic talk to you tonight. And I figured maybe it will hopefully get better when you ask questions too. So um, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Father Jonathan. And if you have questions, if you'd put them in the Q&A, but one question I would be very remiss if I did not ask, I heard that you say, you said that you were at the canonization of yes. St. Junipero. Do you have any, any memories, any fond memories of that or anything that stood out to you about that canonization? Yeah, well, I think the first thing I remember is just very human. It was a very hot day in Washington, <laughs> D.C., a so strong sun, and I don't have much on top here. So I was... Uh, I think at points I had a ball cap on, even with my chasuble, because I knew I was going to be so sunburned, you know, but it was a very warm day. But I just remember, I think it was just beautiful that we were doing this on American soil, mm -hmm. you know, that that Unipero Sarah, you know, uh, you know, just this man who was an evangelist of the Americas. And we were we were literally in front of the, the shrine of the Immaculate Conception in Washington, D.C. And it was just just exciting for everyone to experience a canonization outside of Rome on our home soil to feel sort of Pope Francis coming to the U.S. And, um, you know, it was it was just a really exciting moment to experience that. Thank you. Somebody's asking. So Christina's asking, yes. Shmiz, your best college roommate. Hi, Christy. I'm glad you're on. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I've got a friend online here. That's great. Yeah, so Chrissy Smeezing and uh, Greg, uh, yeah, of course, you know, so I, um, one of the beautiful things of Franciscan University is households, small faith communities, mm -hmm. and that helped to me, open me up more to my vocation and my call, and in fact, some of my brothers in household are priests today uh, serving as well, so great to have the shout out, Chrissy. Yeah. And then this is, I see another one. Uh, this might be Judy Cousins, but I don't know, Judy, if this is you. Uh, it says, our vocation ministry, we started 10 years ago in the parish, and they now have seven men in seminary and two in religious formation. That is amazing. So that wow. was just a comment. And then um, uh, another one, uh, Reese O'Donnell. Thank you, Father Jonathan. My daughter and son-in-law son went to Franciscan, and he did net. And they now live in Steubenville. Yeah, so you have many friends on this call, I could tell. Yeah. That's great. Wonderful to have the connections. And if that is Bishop Cousins' family, I, I thank you for Bishop Cousins is such a wonderful gift to our church. And um, um, he's been a wonderful um, a supporter of our campus, too. So thank you. Yes. Uh, another thing that you mentioned that I thought was really insightful was about being rooted in the Lord. And you made the correlation of we have to we have to sort of like go into the silence and especially with young people now with all the electronics. How do you invite them 
to shut it off. Yeah. I mean, it starts with me. How do I invite myself? You know, um, I think that that's something it's a, it's a call to, to begin here. Um, and that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that, um, it, it may be, I, I like to tell the students when the Lord calls us to a fast or to some sort of, um, yeah, let's say fasting. Um, he, it, he's not calling us to not eat for a day, you know, at all. He's calling us, it, it might be easier to do that. Like, hey, I'm just going to not touch any food. He's calling us to moderation. And I think in an oversaturated culture with technology, it starts by just having momentary separation points. So what I would say is, all right, if you're, can you commit to 15 minutes of quiet prayer a day? And can you either put your phone on the other side of the room or can you turn it off? And that itself might be a big step for a lot of us, you know, and even just separating ourselves in that way. And so I think inviting young people to do that, inviting ourselves to do that is really important. Um, if you want to learn more about, there is a, a movement in the church uh, called humanality, humanality. And I don't know if you've heard of that, but um, some folks who are connected to Franciscan have been really working to, um, to share this sort of sense of separating from technology a little bit more. And I think it's worth looking into. And we've had some students on our campus who actually have been doing that as well. Hey, thank you. And I have two more questions here. One, that was Judy Cousins. And she says, thanks for inviting Bishop Cousins to your campus to discuss the Eucharist. So that's his, his mom's on the, on it watching Wonderful. right now. And Wonderful. then also um, Anne Champagne is asking if you can uh, explain the perpetuitic phase of formation. Sure. That's a great question. The propedeutic stage. So this is sort of a new, uh, I will give my best explanation, but um, this is a new stage in, I would say, diocesan priestly formation. Um, in, in religious life, um, for men and women, men in religious life, and some of you may be familiar with this, have what's called a novitiate. And men do one year in the novitiate. Women often do two years in the novitiate. Um, and that novitiate year is a year focused very much, um, it's sort of a, a year where you pull away from formal academic studies and you focus on spiritual formation and human formation. Um, it's a year where you um, um, sort of go through, you ready yourself for the more intentional academic formation in the life. What I think that um, the church has sort of seen that diocesan priesthood candidates need, and again, I'm speaking as a religious, so a diocesan priest might describe this a little differently, but they, they, are, they are saying that they feel it would be helpful to, in the initial formation of seminarians, to first have more of an intentional sort of human formation preparation year rather than launch into studies and perhaps not grow at those foundational levels. And then that can kind of catch up to you at a later point. So this is a this is sort of a new development in the life of the church. And, and so dioceses are trying to figure out well, what does that look like and how do we do it? And, and do we do it together? And, 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 and there's still a lot of questions that, that go along with it. Thank you. And I'm going to recommend listeners, if you, there is a new YouTube out from the Pacific Northwest uh, retreat that was like about two weeks ago. And they, uh, the one of the professors at Mount Angel Seminary Angel. talks about the propedeutic year. And then also we had another talk in New Orleans from that conference on propedeutic, the propedeutic house. So if you're really interested, please go and check those two uh, videos out. Let's see, I have, ooh, we've got three questions here, but I'm only gonna take the first one and that this will be the last one. And I apologize to my other two. Um, someone mentions that uh, they belong to uh, NCCW, National Council of Catholic Women. And one of the, their resolutions is to better understand mental health. 
and they're asking if you have any resources that you would recommend. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hmm. Not off the top of my head. I probably I probably should. Um, I I would have to think about that more. Um, let me think as I'm talking, maybe I can recommend, um, some places that I would look, um, um, you might've heard of the, I think it's called the John Paul II center for healing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bob shoots out of Florida. Um, anything that he does is really good. And I wouldn't be surprised if he has some resources on his site related to mental health and spirituality. Um, there's an author by the name of Greg Bataro, who talks a lot about, in a very good Orthodox, holy sense, Catholic mental health issues. Um, and I think he would be somebody to look into and look at. Um, from a sociological point of view, there was a study a, a few years back that might almost be dated now, but by a woman by the name of Jean Twenge, I think it's T-W-E-N-G-E, I forget the name of it, but it was interesting and in how it spoke of the culture. Um, those are some things that come to mind. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for spending some time with us, Father. And uh, I wish we had more time for questions because I, we just got a couple of them, but do I do thank you. And now I'm going to remind you that this, all of our listeners, this is recorded. So the presentation will be available very shortly. Boy, I bet it'll be this week on our YouTube channel. Um, so we're going to go into the business portion of the meeting right now. And today we've got two subjects. The first one is Maura Lett, who is our VP for vocations. And she's going to talk to us about the work of her committee. And then also Pat Manzo, who's a member of the board of the Sarah Foundation, is going to talk to us about one of their recent grants um, that, they, that they awarded. So um, we're going to start with Maura. Maura? Thank you, Anne. Thank you for inviting me to talk. Well, I'm Moira quinn Late, the Vice President of Vocations for the U.S. Council, and I would like to introduce you to the new Sarah Spark website. Father, I can't wait for you to take a look at it because I've got some great thoughts that I'd like to share with you. But it's been a two and a half year project for the Vocation Committee. We have some really outstanding sage Sarans who are on the Vocation Committee, and they have offered tremendous wisdom have you read the book of Holiness for the Saren? Well, in there, they talk about the leaven. The leaven in Sarah is this wonderful wisdom that the Sarens who've been Sarens a long time have to offer. So that's what Sarah Spark is. It is the leaven of all the knowledge that's available to help all of us as we walk and talk with those we want to help on their journey for vocations. So here is the website address, and I'd like you to copy this down. Do you see this? Can you see this? Okay, there we are. Everybody see it? Please write it down now. It's a little different than www, because the way we developed this would allow everyone to go into it exclusively so you don't have to go through a million other things right now the way the u.s council website has it you go through resources and then you gradually get to sarah spark so we chose to design it with a specific task and a specific goal of how to get to it i'm going to pull that down and you can put this in chat i wanted to share it with you because sometimes we don't hear something as well as when we see it okay but we used to have 28 tools now we've added three more so that is what 31 tools each tool includes a description history and implementation of and supporting materials the supporting materials include references and hot links to source materials and organizations using the tools and new to the website are sarah spark helpers what is a sarah spark helper well Many times, like Priesthood Sunday or Traveling Crucifix or a contest, there are things we would like to borrow. Well, everything on the Sarah Spark website is free and available for everyone. And those Sarah Spark helpers, you click on them. It might be a design of a card. It might be a design of any number of things. But it's yours 
to custom to your need. So that's what a Sarah Spark Helper is. It's something that helps you get moving and getting a project going. To get to the Sarah Spark Helper, I want to tell you how I do it. Because when we're out, like father or anybody else, we want something to talk with people about, and we get to it on our phone. Why? Because we could be out, we could have been at mass, and we ran into someone we knew, and they had a question for us about something. Well, then we might just simply say, okay, I think I want to go in, and I think I want to talk to someone about that program. You know that program called Call by Name? Yes, Bob Rudman, it's a great program sharing your wonderful coins, but all the pieces of that particular thing is there. But you could see this young man, and if you don't know much about the tools of Call by Name, once you study each of these 31 tools, there are some dynamic single pieces to help you. This traveling coin is wonderful. Father, if you had seen a young man and you were talking to them a little bit, and you reached in your pocket with a coin and you said, you know, you, you remind me so much of someone I've known so much in my life. And your way of expressing yourself makes me think that you might be an amazing priest. And so you reach in your pocket and you pass this coin to this young man. And that's a treasure. Someone singled them out. Someone liked the, something about what they're saying that made them feel good about their, their nature. So all of these little tools are a combination of many, many skills and many, many Saren's tools that they've been using. But the fun thing is, if you saw that young man, look at him here. We've got many young men who've been given the tools from the ages of seven all the way up to whatever the age is. And so we may be talking to somebody about something and we've got the information right in our hand to talk about what's going on, not to run home and print something out from our computer, which we can do to do the programs. But, you know, when sometimes Anne and I and others are at, at, a, at a some presentation and someone says something that makes us think about something, we can go right to it on our phone. Do not forget that this is a great tool in itself being on your phone. Then, and Jerry Bees knows what I'm going to talk about next. I'm going to talk about the seven greats. Did you know that the first seven of these tools was compiled into a beautiful document called the seven greats? It was originally four or five items that were called a sampler, but now we've brought these into an English and a Spanish manuscript that allows us to hand this out to someone who might be interested in working on the program. There, there are many people we run into. It could be a group in our church. It could be other Sarens, but they may not have seen all the different possibilities with those tools. So these are available. We can send these out from the office. We can send them out. Email me. You, my email has been presented tonight. And you're able to get these to press to other people because it's a great way of getting people excited about the faith and about different tools to work on together. Anne has been working on a wonderful program called Ignite, which has been going into parishes and building this wonderful community. Well, this is one of those tools within that Ignite program. If you're invited Ignite to come to your parish, you might receive one of these seven greats. At the National Eucharistic Congress, we had the privilege of, and how many of these did we give out? 625. I had to unmute. <laughs> okay. 625 of these were given out. I have gotten emails from people. I have no idea who they are, but they had my email address and they've emailed me and said, wow, this is going to help me in this program or that program I'm doing. Then I had the privilege of telling them, this is the beginning. Now you can go on to sarahspark.org. And we have 31 of these tools that have been well-developed have supporting material called Sarah Helpers, and that helps your community to have something fun to work on together. Now, I bet there are questions, okay? But it, you know, it's one of those things, you can never answer all the questions. But Father, there was one thing you said that really is so true. As Sarans, we are collaborators with God. 
it's an amazing concept. But working in the Sarah world as a VP, it's a privilege to meet all the people we meet and to share all the wonderful tools that our Lord has for us to listen to someone and share his glory. I could talk forever, you know that, Anne, but I'm I'm just going to um, open it up to questions. And if you would be able to do the questions for me, Anne, that would be wonderful. Do we have any questions? Um, anyone else? Jerry, you've had a chance to, to see the seven grades. Tell me something that you learned from the seven grades. Well, it's well-developed uh, and it narrows it down to get people focused in. And uh, as long as I'm on here, I guess I want to thank Father uh, Jonathan for, um, you know, a great presentation. You really honed in on what we ought to hear and sharing your vocation story, as well as, uh, you know, sharing Steubenville in terms of in the 70s, it was listed as one of the top 10 party schools. And like you said, Father Michael Scanlon just turned it around and said, you know, here's what we're going to do and uh, challenged rather than softening um, our faith. And it continues to grow. And it's amazing what uh, Steubenville does. And yes, thank you. Yeah. And I'm going to thank both of you. And I'm going to turn it over. I've got just a little bit of time left. And Pat, more thank you. Jeremy, don't go away because I'm going to bring you back. Uh, Pat, you're going to talk to us about something, a grant that the foundation has given. Which one? Okay. I. Um, it is the Carmelite Sisters of the Most Sacred Heart of Los Angeles, and they are located in Alhambra. I live in the Diocese of Orange, which is between San Diego and Los Angeles Archdiocese. <laughs> and so I live about a little more than an hour from this, from their mother house. But their mother house is only a mile from the Mission San Gabriel, which we all gave money to when it burned, and which is the first mission I ever went to when I was a child. It was near my childhood home. And so I talked to um, Sister Maria Garetti, who is the vocations director mm -hmm. at at the um for the Carmelites and she told me what they did with the grant money um it was a surprise to me to find out that almost well she said 96 percent of their women who enter their convent are either former focus missionaries or they went to a university where they had focus. So it's all through focus. And she told a lot of what Sister Marie Goretti told me was like Father Jonathan mentioned. The most important thing is um, person to person, talking to the people in person. So she said, you have to talk to them maybe two or three times before they come to visit at the mother house. There are 121 nuns at the mother house. And so what they did with our money this year was they went to the vocation director's annual convention where they spent the week with the two or 300 diocesan priests and collaborated in outreach and young and evangelization to young adults. And from that conference, they, they met a couple of um, priests who invited them to do retreats and discernment retreats in their diocese. And then um, they go to universities and th these are some of the nuns with their um, people at Focus. Some of them are at Focus universities. This one is at their convent because these are the postulants and novices at their convent in Alhambra. Um, so they try to create these relationships with these women and then they invite, then they come to visit and pray with them and maybe visit with them and spend a little time at the convent. Their um, charism is they do education, healthcare, 
and retreats. And the people in my parish actually go there for retreats every year. So they have got they have received um, grants from the foundation three times, but we don't ever give them as much as they ask for. And that's why we would this in about two weeks, the um, the appeal will come out from the the annual appeal from the foundation. And we hope that everybody will donate so that we can give larger and more grants in the future. And also in November, um, we're sent in teams of two, we're sent the grant applications. And then in December, we meet in Chicago and that's when we decide who will receive the grants. Every year, there are a couple that receive them every year and then the others are individual grants. So we hope that you will all help by sending some contribution when the appeal comes out in maybe two weeks. It comes out in November. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you, Pat. And remember, just as a reminder to all of our Sarans, a donation to the Sarah Foundation is a very convenient way for Sarans to promote our Sarah mission for the worldwide church. And so it's it's really critical that as Sarans, we we embrace this mission and that we um, give some money to our foundation. So watch your mail. Right. I'm sure we'll be getting, I'm sure we'll be getting something in the mail very soon. Um, right. right before our closing prayer, I want to invite Jerry Bees to just talk to us about uh, a preview for some uh, like our speaker lineup as we move forward with Sarah Meets. Jerry? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Well, we've got speakers lined up for the next uh, five months. I won't spend a whole lot of time, but at least I think highlight the next two months in that the Sarah International President, Moira McQueen, is going to speak about the uh, Sarah around the world, the international strategic plan. In December, we're going to have uh, Bishop Thomas Daly. He will, from Spokane, he will do some weekly reflections, but then he'll do a live reflection on the third Monday. And again, I'm probably speaking to the choir, but to remind you that we now meet the third Monday uh, of the month at uh, 7 p.m. Central. And I guess I could list January here. If I January, we're having Rose Sullivan. Um, some of you, hopefully many of you know her, she's the executive director of the National Conference of Diocesan Vocational Directors. And then we got Father Jack Wall from the Catholic Extension in February, and then Cardinal Collins will be in March. That's exciting, Jerry. Thank you so much for both you and Greg and the work that you do in getting all these amazing speakers lined up. This is, this is a, a wonderful mission that you guys are doing. Um, and I'm hoping everyone remembers to join us on November the 18th. It's a Monday, 7 o'clock Central Time. And please do not forget to register for our upcoming um, Sarah Rally in uh, Miami, Florida in January. It's going to be very warm. It'll be lovely. Um, take a break from the winter and then just join us uh, January 23rd to the 26th for a really amazing event. Um, and then I... There were two questions. I just want to make a comment. Someone asked uh, how do they, um, if they could be a member of the vocations committee. So just contact Moira. She yeah. will, she will put you to work immediately. <laughs> and another one was uh, how do you have an Ignite workshop? Contact me. We would love to do something. We're going to, I think Toledo's the next one. No, no, no. Phoenix is next, which is kind of exciting. Yeah. So let's finish with our closing prayer. And I'm going to invite uh, Anne Champagne oh, to lead us with, with our closing prayer. Anne? Yes. My pleasure. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our prayer for perseverance in vocations. O oh God, you have constituted your only begotten Son, supreme and eternal priest, for the glory of your majesty and the salvation of mankind. Grant that those whom he has chosen ministers and dispensers of his mysteries 
may be found faithful in fulfilling the ministry they have received. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Ann, and thank you for um, agreeing to be the uh, regional director for our specific region in the United States as a member of our U.S. Council. Also to Father Jonathan St. Andrew, which was, oh my gosh, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Father. And um, Moralette, uh, Pat Manzo, Jerry Bees, and Greg, who's on retreat someplace. And then behind the scenes, John Liston, our executive director and his staff, and we could not do this without them. So that concludes our meeting for this month. Thanks to everybody who attended. Uh, thank you for all you do. Spread the word about the the work of Sarah about our mission and be safe, continue to pray for vocations. And I hope to see you either at the rally or maybe at a Sarah club meeting. I'm going to DuPage County soon, uh, or maybe at an Ignite workshop or a retreat. Um, I can't remember where I'm going on retreat. Yes, in Minnesota. So I think that's uh, North Central. I will be there. Or absolutely, we'll see you in January at the rally. God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you.